Well, welcome back to another edition of Community Colour, bringing you arts and entertainment right here from the Alberta Valley. Well, the Community Arts Council is very excited to bring to you our current art exhibit. It is Aller and Friends. Now, that's Robert Aller, and he was a well-known artist. Now, this exhibit is on display until the end of March. We've had an extension, so we're hoping everybody stops by the Roland Art Centre and check out this amazing art collection. Now, it was donated to the Community Arts Council back in 1995, a portion of it, and some of that collection is on display display right now. So stop by the Roland Art Centre between Tuesday and Saturday 11 till 4. Well the Roland Art Centre has a call to artists right now for exhibiting at the Roland Art Centre in the calendar year of 2022. The deadline for this is April 29th so you can stop by the Roland Art Centre and pick up your application. Well the Community Arts Council is having a special for our mystery book bags for the month of February. So a little romance goes a long way and we're offering 20 books, 20 romance books for $25 and it includes a little sweet bit of chocolate in it so hopefully you'll come down and help with a fundraiser for the Roland Art Centre so you can either call and reserve your bags today or stop by the Roland Art Centre. We're calling all artists. The Roland Art Center has decided to have a COVID art exhibit. Now this is by invitation, so if you'd like to have more information, what we're trying to do is figure or see what artists have been working on in the last year during the pandemic. Um, lots of creativity has been going on and we'd like to display that right here at the Roland Art Center. So this exhibit is gonna be from October 5th to the 30th of this month. And you can contact me here at the Roland Art Center. Information will be on the screen for more information. The deadline for our call to artists, which is our Valley Artist and Studio Guide being put on, presented by the Community Arts Council, has now extended our deadline until the end of February. So if you're interested in, in entering your name or your studio or your gallery in our artist studio, please contact me at the Roland Art Center. All the information will be on the screen, but it's a great way to promote your local artists and to get the word out there that there's some amazing artists right here in the Alberni Valley. Well, the mystery book bags have been a great success in helping raise some funds for the Roland Art Center that we're continuing on with them. Now we have genres of fiction and fantasy, we've got children's books, we've got teenage books, we've got cookbooks, we've got all types of genres. So please contact us today if you would like to reserve your bag. Now it's um, $20 um, for 10 books, so it's a great deal and it's a great way to help a fundraiser for the Roland Art Center. Well, the Community Arts Council would like to send a big thank you out to the community for always donating your books to us for our May book sale. So as you all know, um, restrictions are in place with the COVID pandemic and we'd like to, as it stands right now, we are holding back on donations. So please thank you very much for thinking of us, but we're asking you to just hang on to your books until such times that we're allowed to take those books. Well, the local Bottle Depot is now accepting donations of your bottles to help the Roland Art Centre. We have an account down there, so if you'd like to help the Roland Art Centre by donating donating your bottles, please take them down to the Bottle Depot and tell them that it is for the Community Arts Council. Now, all the information is down there, but it'll also be on the screen. Or if you'd like inf more information, you can contact me right here at the Roland Arts Centre. Well, the Community Arts Council has a change of date for our annual general meeting. So it now, rather than the end of February, which normally it takes place, it's happening on Thursday, April 29th. Now, we're not sure in terms of, of where it's going to be, whether it's going to be held at the Roland Art Centre or via Zoom. It's all dependent on our restrictions. So more information will come, so please mark your calendars for April 29th at 7 p.m. Well, that's it for another edition of Community Colour. Now, if your organisation would like to share any upcoming events or information with everybody, please contact me at the Roland Art Centre. So until next time, I'm Melissa Martin for Community Colour. Hi there, Dave Cousin with Community Policing here in Port Alberni. I really want to talk to you a little bit about school bus safety. We are getting complaints from various sectors in the community around people violating uh, the rules when it comes to stopping for school buses. When a school bus is stopped with its flashing lights on, that means as a driver, you got to stop and allow the school bus to accept and discharge its passengers. The, the school buses in, in particular actually have high definition video cameras and they are capturing violators going around the buses when they're stopped. What's happening is these pictures are coming to the police and the police are actually going out to the registered owners of the vehicles and issuing $368 fines. So that's a lot of money and really we want people to be safe, especially around kids in our community and around school buses. So please, when you see the red lights flashing, stop, allow the passengers to get in on off the bus and be mindful of our streets.
Collections Curator at the Alberni Valley Museum. Today on Museum at Home, we're going to look at the wedding dresses in the museum's collection. We have three wedding dresses in the collection, or rather, three that we know were worn as wedding dresses. Being able to afford a dress that was worn only once, particularly a white dress that was difficult to clean, wasn't an option for everyone, and many brides have often simply worn their best dress on their wedding day. The first dress we're looking at is a silk dress from around 1900. In 1968, before the museum was established, the dress was donated to the Museum and Historical Society by the Alexander Estate. The only note on its history was that it was the wedding dress of Mrs. D.C. Alexander. With a bit of research, we discovered that D.C. stood for Dewitt Clayton. Dewitt Clayton Alexander was born in 1875 in Wisconsin and came to Canada around 1909. His wife, Ethel Gladys Alexander, would have been born around 1883. We backtrack the number because we know she was 82 when she died in 1965. In that time period, just after 1900, women were typically married between the ages of 20 to 25, which would put the date of the dress from 1903 to 1908. Though it looks like a dress, this outfit goes on in three pieces, the bodice, the skirt, and the belt. The skirt and bodice do up at the center back with hook and eye closures, while the belt is up at the front, under the flower detail. Homemade, it is mostly machine stitched, with some hand stitching. The bodice is cut long at the front to allow for the pouch look that was popular in the early 1900s. In this 1910 wedding portrait, you can see Clarice O. Blackmore with the same pouched look. Clarice is also wearing a belt that points down at the front, as does the Alexander dress. The fabric of the Alexander dress is a very light silk that is almost transparent. In these photos, we've put a plain cotton slip on the mannequin, and the mannequin itself has been shaped to mimic the undergarments of the era. Ethel would have worn it with a corset and petticoats underneath. Silk stockings likely would have been worn with this formal outfit, and for jewelry, perhaps a brooch, a long string of pearls, or a spray of fresh flowers. In this wedding portrait from the same era, we see that the bride's dress also has a high neck and a belted waist. Our second dress is from the flapper era. The 1920s dress is slim and boyish, a marked contrast only 20 years after the Alexander dress. It was worn by Dora Osborne when she married Alf Plant on New Year's Eve in 1924. Dora was originally from Nanaimo, but came to Port Alberni in 1928, where she and her husband opened a bakery. Now you should know that we would never try on a piece from the museum's costume collection, because historic textiles can be very fragile. However, before donating this dress to the museum, the family photographed one of Dora's great-granddaughters wearing the dress. It's made of silk georgette, which drapes nicely. Together with the drop waist, it gives the dress a long, straight profile, the boyish look that was popular in the 1920s. The dress has some simple decorations of lace and long pieces of velvet ribbon on the skirt and on one shoulder. The dress is so simple, it's actually a bit difficult to tell the front from the back. As you can see in Dora's wedding photo, pictured with her mother and sisters, the dress was worn with evening gloves, long gloves that reach over the elbow, and a headpiece with a long veil. The headpiece, though not the veil, is also in the museum's collection, though it is quite delicate now, so we haven't photographed it on a mannequin. And though you can't see it in the photo, Dora's garter is also in the museum collection. This wedding portrait, from 1923, also shows the straight flapper style with the drop waist. Throughout the 20s, we see shorter dressers with the boxy look of the dropped waist, though by the 1930s, we see skirts dropping to the ankle. Our final dress is from the 1960s. Joanne Askew made her own wedding dress during the summer of 1961. Joanne studied home economics at UBC, and the museum has, in its collection, two other dresses that Joanne made during her studies at UBC in the mid-1950s. The wedding dress, or outfit, consists of two pieces, a dress with a matching jacket. The sheath dress, a popular style in the 50s and 60s, is made out of a cream-colored satin. Sleeveless, it has narrow straps at the shoulders and a lace overlay on the skirt. The bodice is lined with a satiny material, while the skirt is lined with cotton. The same lace for the skirt overlay is used to make the short matching jacket. The sheath style came on the heels of Dior's new look of the 1950s. 
It had a similar fitted bodice of the new look style, but replaced the wide skirts with a shorter, more fitted option. If you want to see more historic fashions, check out the museum's historic photo collection, available online at portalberni.pastperfectonline.com. A search for dress or portrait will get you started. That's all for today. Thanks for watching the Alberni Valley Museum's Museum at Home. Batteries, your smoke alarms, your small appliances, computer stuff, TVs, we still take all that. And then of course the paint. The only thing we ask is if one of us is not with you and you need to go in the building with any of that, you rate for us. One of us will take you in, show you where it goes and where you can sanitize and then head out. We sanitize daily and nightly for your convenience, our pleasure, <laughs> just to keep it all clean. Um, you will see a difference here as we go through of how clean the inside is. We've already been told by some people it's really clean like a hospital. so. Hopefully you're not scared to come down, do your recycling, say hi. We've missed you. Come on back. to another edition of Community Colour, bringing you arts and entertainment right here from the Alberti Valley. Well, the Community Arts Council is very excited to bring to you our current art exhibit. It is Aller and Friends. Now that's Robert Aller and he was a well-known artist. Now this exhibit is on display until the end of March. We've had an extension, so we're hoping everybody stops by the Roland Art Centre and check out this amazing art collection. Now it was donated to the Community Arts Council back in 1995, a portion of it, and some of that collection is on display right now. So stop by the Roland Art Centre between Tuesday and Saturday, 11 till 4. Well, the Roland Art Centre has a call to artists right now for exhibiting at the Roland Art Centre in the calendar year of 2022. The deadline for this is April 29th, so you can stop by the Roland Art Centre and pick up your application. Well, the Community Arts Council is having a special for our mystery book bags for the month of February. So a little romance goes a long way and we're offering 20 books, 20 romance books, for $25 and it includes a little sweet bit of chocolate in it. So hopefully you'll come down and help with a fundraiser for the Roland Art Centre. So you can either call and reserve your bags today or stop by the Roland Art Centre. We're calling all artists. The Roland Art Centre has decided to have a COVID art exhibit. Now this is by invitation, so if you'd like to have more information, what we're trying to do is figure or see what artists have been working on in the last year during the pandemic. Um, lots of creativity has been going on and we'd like to display that right here at the Roland Art Center. So this exhibit is going to be from October 5th to the 30th of this month and you can contact me here at the Roland Art Center. Information will be on the screen for more information. The deadline for our call to artists, which is our Valley Artist and Studio Guide being put on, presented by the Community Arts Council, has now extended our deadline until the end of February. So if you're interested in, in entering your name or your studio or your gallery in our artist studio, please contact me at the Roland and Art Centre. All the information will be on the screen but it's a great way to promote your local artists and to get the word out there that there's some amazing artists right here in the Alberni Valley. Well the mystery book bags have been a great success in helping raise some funds for the Roland Art Centre that we're continuing on with them. Now we have genres of fiction and fantasy, we've got children's books, we've got teenage books, we've got cookbooks, we've got all types of genres so please contact us today if you would like to reserve your bag. Now it's um, $20 um, for 10 books so it's a great deal and it's a great way to help a fundraiser for the Roland Art Centre. Well, the Community Arts Council would like to send a big thank you out to the community for always donating your books to us for our May book sale. So as you all know, um, restrictions are in place with the COVID pandemic and we'd like to, as it stands right now, we are holding back on donations. So please thank you very much for thinking of us, but we're asking you to just hang on to your books until such times that we're allowed to take those books. Well, the local Bottle Depot is now accepting donations of your bottles to help the Roland Art Centre. We have an account down there, so if you'd like to help the Roland Art Centre by donating donating your bottles, please take them down to the Bottle Depot and tell them that it is for the Community Arts Council. Now, all the information is down there, but it'll also be on the screen. Or if you'd like inf more information, you can contact me right here at the Roland Arts Centre. Well, the Community Arts Council has a change of date for our annual general meeting. So it now, rather than the end of February, which normally it takes place, it's happening on Thursday, April 29th. 
Now we're not sure in terms of, of where it's going to be, whether it's going to be held at the Roland Art Center or via Zoom. It's all dependent on our restrictions. So more information will come, so please mark your calendars for April 29th at 7 p.m. Well, that's it for another edition of Community Colour. Now, if your organization would like to share any upcoming events or information with everybody, please contact me at the Roland Art Centre. So until next time, I'm Melissa Martin for Community Colour. Hi there, Dave Cousin with Community Policing here in Port Alberni. I really want to talk to you a little bit about school bus safety. We are getting complaints from various sectors in the community around people violating uh, the rules when it comes to stopping for school buses. When a school bus is stopped with its flashing lights on, that means as a driver, you got to stop and allow the school bus to accept and discharge its passengers. The, the school buses in, in particular actually have high definition video cameras and they are capturing violators going around the buses when they're stopped. What's happening is these pictures are coming to the police and the police are actually going out to the registered owners of the vehicles and issuing $368 fines. So that's a lot of money and really we want people to be safe, especially around kids in our community and around school buses. So please, when you see the red lights flashing, stop, allow the passengers to get in on off the bus and be mindful of our streets. Hello, this is Kirsten Smith, Collections Curator at the Alberni Valley Museum. This week on Museum at Home, we're looking at the Cameron Lake Chalet. The Cameron Lake Chalet is part of the tradition of Canada's Grand Railway Hotels. It was constructed by the CPR, the Canadian Pacific Railway, in 1910 to 1911 on the eastern shore of Cameron Lake. It was both a station and a resort to encourage tourist travel on the CPR's Vancouver Island subsidiary, the E&N Railway. The CPR saw the economic benefits of tourism in the 1880s, it played a key role in the development of the National Park at Banff, including the construction of hotels and facilities. This was repeated on Vancouver Island, where they opened the Empress Hotel in 1908, with easy access to both their steamship line on Victoria's Inner Harbour and the ENN Railway that would open up the rest of Vancouver Island. The look of the chalet followed a pattern of smaller railway hotels and lodges with shingled bungalow and Tudor revival elements. It was one of two lodges on the island, the other being Strathcona Lodge on Shawnigan Lake. As with their other resorts, the CPR constructed recreational facilities for the tourists, including a hiking trail from Cameron Lake to Mount Aerosmith. With the arrival of the train at Cameron Lake, the stagecoach from Port Alberni to Nanaimo altered its operations to take passengers to the chalet station instead. That was until December of 1911, when the first train came into Port Alberni and the stagecoach stopped entirely. The Cameron Lake Chalet was furnished and ready for business in May of 1912, as the CPR anticipated a busier tourist season with the newly opened rail line to Port Alberni. Although lacking electricity in the early years, note the coal oil lantern on the mantle, the chalet was outfitted in a relatively luxurious manner, following CPR corporate conventions. Our interior photos all date from around 1960, but you can get a hint of the previous grandeur when the hand-planed interior wood paneling was complemented by red carpets and all the hardware was brass. The bathrooms had clawfoot tubs and the guest rooms were outfitted with large beds, washstands and china. Some of the furnishings were saved and form one of the earliest donations to what became the Alberni Valley Museum. Typically, you find this furniture upstairs in the museum, the bed in pieces, though during our temporary exhibit, Vacation Land, we had the bed put together and made up. The furniture is reputed to have come from Scotland and was very heavy. In 1958, most of the chalet's rooms still had the original bedroom sets and guests preferred these rooms, though the staff not so much as they found it difficult to move when they needed to clean. The chalet had 10 guest rooms, a couple of accounts note only five rooms, but the original guest books assign guests to ten different rooms. Hotel rooms in that time period wouldn't have been as spacious, there were no king-size beds, and they wouldn't have had an attached bathroom. 
In fact, there was no running water in the guest rooms. In the summer, when it got busy, additional guests could be accommodated in tents. Meals were served in the dining room, a long room along the south side of the building. Tables would have been set with embroidered tablecloths in blue willow china. Guests would have had full board along with their rooms. In the guest book, you can see that the arrival and departure times are listed as meals. Locals, too, would come to the chalet for meals. Some would come for tea or for Sunday dinner, while others would break their journey between Port Alberni and the East Coast by having lunch here. Though today it only takes 20 to 25 minutes to get from Port Alberni to the chalet location, in 1912 it would have been a longer journey. The cars didn't go as fast, provided, of course, that you had a car and weren't traveling by horse and buggy. And the road wasn't paved. It was rocky and twisty. There was a bridge out over the lake as you went around Angel Rock, and in some spots, like in Cathedral Grove, the road was only wide enough for one car to squeeze between those giant trees. Guests at the chalet would come for a weekend getaway or a week-long excursion of boating, fishing, and hiking. Here we see a guest entry for boats only. In 1912, the CPR built a trail from the chalet up Mount Aerosmith. It was well marked with stone cairns, so visitors could easily find their way down in the fog. About 12 and a half kilometers from the chalet, they built a cabin, a sort of base camp on the tree line. It was stocked with a cook stove, utensils, and dishes so that guests could make a short stay up there. Pack horses were available to carry things up so guests wouldn't be encumbered, and the guests could even ride the pack horses as far as the cabin. From that cabin, you could take the easier hike up Mount Coakley, or the more challenging hike up Mount Aerosmith. The trail was used by guests and locals. There's a story of eight young men who hiked the trail in August of 1927. They left Port Alberni after work on Saturday at 9 p.m. They reached the cabin, pictured here, on the slopes of Mount Coakley at 3 a.m., where they slept until 5 a.m. On Sunday morning, five of them made it to Coakley Ridge, and these three... Wynne Beck and the brothers John and George Williamson made it to the summit of Mount Aerosmith before they all headed home Sunday afternoon. The trail still exists and is still enjoyed by locals. Here we see the Tuesday morning hikers in 1987 on the Aerosmith Trail. In its early years, the chalet was operated directly by the CPR. The first managers were Mr. and Mrs. Adam Monks, with Mr. Monks also serving as the hunting and fishing guide. Unfortunately, Lieutenant Monks was killed in 1917, serving in World War I, and after a few more years, his disheartened widow turned over the operations to Mr. and Mrs. Woollett. Mr. Woollett had retired as head steward of CPR coastal ships. Mrs. Woollett was interviewed in 1969. She was 97 at the time. One of her memories of the chalet was a time when a snowstorm cut them off and they had to wait for the snowplows to dig them out. When the Woolets left in 1938, the CPR leased the chalet to a series of operators. Jack LaRock was the last operated as a resort from 1958 to 1966. Following the trajectory of other Alberni Valley destination resorts, it appears that the chalet flourished as a tourist operation in the years up to and following World War II. The chalet guest books from 1912 to 1917 donated to the Alberni District Historical Society by Mr. LaRocque, show that many of the guests were the elites from B.C., the U.S.A., and Europe. They included politicians, business owners, capitalists, and even a few aristocrats. The CPR strategy of providing a conveniently accessed mountain wilderness vacation only a few hours away from Victoria seems to have succeeded. Many of the guests arrived with servants, and in many cases were driven there by chauffeurs. The register reveals that half of the guests were from Vancouver Island, including many from Victoria, but only 4% of them from the Alberni Valley. A quarter of the guests were from BC's Lower Mainland, and 15% from the USA, with the other 10% from the rest of Canada or Europe. In these early years, the chalet was a destination resort, where visitors would often stay for a week. However, in the 1950s and 60s, as automobile transportation improved with the Pacific Rim Highway and the E&N abandoned its passenger service, it simply became a stop on the way to somewhere else. Viability as a resort had ended, and combined with its deteriorating condition, it was demolished around 1969, signaling the end of the era of rail tourism in this region. That's all for this week. I hope you've enjoyed watching the Alberni Valley Museum's Museum at Home. 
This is Shelley Harding, Museum Coordinator and Education Curator with the Albany Valley Museum. Adopting an artifact at the Albany Valley Museum is a fun and easy way to show your appreciation for Port Alberni's history, cultural heritage, to connect with your favorite object and support the museum. Your tax-deductible contribution will help us preserve and protect the collection while also helping to support other museum activities, including exhibits, events, and school programs. The adoptions last for one year and enable the Alberni Valley Museum to continue to protect and preserve the history, heritage, and culture of the Alberni Valley for future generations. The artifacts you see are some of the objects available for adoption. At the $75 level, we have this punch bowl and stand painted by Josephine Wark. Mrs. Wark is best known locally as the proprietor of Klitza Lodge at Sprout Lake. Painted around 1905, before she moved to the Alberni Valley, the pottery is an example of the fashionable hobby of painting on china. At the $100 level, we have this flapper era wedding dress. It was worn by Dora Plant when she got married on New Year's Eve in 1924. Available for adoption at the $500 level is this hand-stitched dress from around 1850. In-house, we often refer to this one as the sleeve dress, as it comes with an alternate set of sleeves, so the wearer could change the look of her outfit. Available for adoption at the $1,000 level is this 19th century dugout canoe made by the well-regarded Nidanat canoe maker, Sam Campbell. The canoe is unique and well-designed due to the outward curve on the inside and was likely used for fishing. To receive a digital catalogue with the complete list of available artifacts or to learn more about the Adopt an Artifact program, please contact the Alberni Valley Museum. Hi, my name is Marilyn Buchert and I'm a member of the Port Alberni Community Action Team. These flags are set out to remember the 46 people from the Central Island area who have lost their lives because of a drug overdose. Why I have put them up is because they are not junkies, they are not pieces of garbage, they are people who were suffering we didn't walk in their shoes. We don't know why they got started on drugs, but they are human beings and they deserve some recognition. In their families and loved ones' homes, or 46 chairs are going to be empty this Christmas. These people will be missed. The other reason I'm putting these here is I'm hoping that somebody who is still using drugs will realize how many people are being killed because of what is being put into the drugs and that they will either stop and go and get help or if they're not ready to stop, if they will use their drugs safely by getting them tested, by following the other recommendations such as using with somebody else as well. Please remember these are people too and their memories are precious to anybody who cared about them or loved them. Thank you very much.